Thank you, everyone, uh, for attending this talk. My name is Aaron Barajas. I am currently a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Physics and Astronomy in the University of California, Irvine, in the Sanchez Yamagishi group. Um, as the name of the group suggests, our PI is Professor Javier Sanchez Yamagishi, and we are a group uh, dedicated to measuring quantum transport properties of 2D materials. So let's talk a little bit about high frequency sound waves. As we all know, uh, ultrasound has many uh, applications in our daily life in very different fields like uh, science, medicine, security. But how are we currently uh, generating the sound waves for this type of electronic application? So the basic idea behind it is that we need to create a periodical mechanic uh, perturbation in the material. And there are two mainstream ways uh, to do this. So the most common of these methods is uh, piezoelectric generation, which uh, uses uh, exactly piezoelectric materials that have a mechanical response to electric fields. And one way to create um, waves with this is to deposit uh, this uh, metallic metallic uh, contacts, uh, comb shape, and uh, apply a uh, radio frequency signal through them. And so this is going to uh, create a certain uh, pattern of contractions and expansions that are going to create a surface acoustic wave. And the wavelength of, of uh, that wave that we are creating is going to be defined by the separation between uh, these metallic contacts. So the other uh, way of creating a high frequency sound wave is a more state of the art method, which are laser driven methods. So the idea of this is that they use a pulse laser to create uh, these mechanical perturbations. And this can be done in uh, many different ways. Some people use uh, gratings to transform that pulse of the laser into uh, mechanical perturbation. Some other people use uh, optomechanical crystals, but the idea is that all of them use uh, pulse lasers. And so what are the issues with the current uh, ways that we have right now to generate high frequency uh, sound? So for the piezoelectric generation, we have uh, maximum frequencies around the tens of the gigahertz. Uh, and these uh, maximum frequencies are basically limited by the nanofabrication processes because uh, it is very hard to define uh, very like smaller than 100 nanometer uh, features. And so that's why the frequencies are limited. Whereas the for the laser driven methods, we can reach very high frequencies of up to two terahertz, but it requires a very complex optical setup that are also hard to integrate to compact devices. So uh, the general idea behind this investigation is that we lack on com uh, compact on chip sources of high, tera high frequency acoustic waves, specifically in the range of the terahertz. So um, why should we care? Or what is the importance of the terahertz uh, regime in acoustic waves? Well, it turns out that in crystals, the quantized vibrations of the atomic lattice, lattice or phonons are in this range of frequencies. And what is very interesting is that the wavelength of this uh, terahertz regime is in the nanometer scale. So we can think of uh, very interesting possible applications for this type of waves. Uh, for instance, in medicine, we can think of new types of imaging techniques for uh, diagnosis. Um, in physics and nanotechnology, we can think of, so in biology, there are currently these uh, acoustic tweezers for isolate cells. So we can think of something similar, but for electrons. And for material science, we can think of an ultrasonic nanoscanner that allows us to detect, uh, for instance, defects in electrical circuits in the nanometer uh, scale. So 
what other alternatives do we have to create these high frequency uh, sound waves? Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit about sharing of radiation. So when electrically charged particles travel through a media at speeds higher than the speed of light in that specific media, there is uh, an emission of uh, radiation known as the sharing of radiation that we uh, can appreciate as a blue or a violet glow. And this is regularly seen in nuclear reactors. So it turns out that for crystals, we have the also the acoustic version of this phenomenon. And um, what happens is that when we uh, apply a voltage in a material to accelerate uh, the electrons towards a certain direction, what we are doing is uh, that we are tilting the Fermi level of that material. And so in the case, for instance, of this example that I have here, we are gonna have more uh, right movers than left movers. And so if we increase that voltage, we are going to tilt even more the Fermi uh, level, and then we are going to have larger uh, drift velocities for those uh, electrons. And so we're gonna reach a point specifically when the drift velocity of those electrons uh, is higher than the speed of sound in that specific material, where we're gonna have a lot of low energy states in the left that the electrons moving to the right can backscatter to and emit a phonon in the process. And these uh, will be uh, electrically generated phonons. And what is interesting about this is that in graphene, it is uh, quite easy to have uh, drift velocities for the carriers that are larger than the speed of sound in graphene. And what is more interesting about it is that it's been predicted that this phonon emission due to the sharing of effect in graphene uh, is going to happen in the terahertz regime. And so uh, recently, the research group where uh, Professor Sanchez Yamagishi used to work uh, made this uh, very interesting experiment where they basically detected this uh, phonon amplification in graphene devices by using uh, local noise probes. And they uh, were able to find that this uh, phonon uh, population grows in the direction of the flow of the carriers and it grows exponentially uh, in that direction. And so we expect, of course, that this increase in the population of phonons is going to affect uh, somehow the electrical properties of our device. And so the question that we wanted to answer with this specific project was, can we detect the phonon amplification uh, process with regular resistance measurements or resistivity measurements. Okay, so to answer that question, uh, we designed a very simple uh, experiment. Uh, so we basically fabricated long, clean graphene encapsulated devices. And we uh, have in those devices, uh, several equally spaced voltage tabs. And the idea of this is that we want to measure uh, the resistant behavior through uh, the length of the material when we are applying a high current. And as simple as this experiment uh, may seem, it has not been done before. So uh, this is gonna be uh, very interesting. And so you can see that here I have a uh, high kind of like uh, indicating uh, something weird. <laughs> so let's write down a few numbers about graphene. So for a carrier concentration of 1.5, uh, 10 to the minus 12 centimeter uh, to the minus two, and a drift velocity equal to the speed of sound in graphene of 21 kilometers per second, high current density uh, will be um, uh, 50 microamps uh, per micrometer, which is actually a very uh, low uh, current density for a graphene device. So, um, okay, let's see uh, the results uh, from this experiment. And so, okay, 
First, uh, let's focus on the IV curve that we directly measure from this uh, graphing device. So what we should expect from a regular um, omic material is that we have a linear dependence of the voltage uh, versus the current. And that is what we see at uh, low current. But when we start increasing the current, we see that we start having this kind of uh, non-linear behavior uh, happening in the IV curves. So this suggests that the resistivity of the material of the device is actually changing. So to make uh, this analysis easier, uh, we calculated the differential resistivity uh, between all uh, the pairs of contacts that we are measuring. And so um, let's pay attention first to this uh, blue curve. So we can see that for this blue curve, for um, positive uh, current, we see a super linear increment of the differential resistivity. Whereas for negative uh, current, the resistivity remains almost unchanged. And so what happens if we look at another line, let's say for instance, this uh, purple line. So we see the opposite. We see that for positive currents, we have a very small variation of the differential resistivity, whereas for uh, negative uh, currents, we see a super linear increase of the resistivity. And this basically tells us that there is an asymmetric non-ohmic behavior at high currents. And if we pay attention to uh, the contacts whose uh, I, uh, whose resistivity we are uh, showing here, you can see that these are contacts that are in opposite sides of the device. So this kind of indicates that we have a spatial uh, dependence in the resistivity uh, increase. So if we plot directly the differential resistivity versus the distance traveled by the carriers, at the spot where they are, where, where the voltage drop is measured, we can see that the resistivity always grows in the direction of the carrier flow. For instance, if we have that the origin of the electrons is in contact one, and they're moving towards the right, we can see that at higher drift velocities, there is a more uh, marked superlinear increase of the resistivity. If we reverse the current to the other, uh, to the left, then this increase of the resistivity occurs uh, to the left of the device. And if we change the type of carriers to holes, uh, we see the same effect. If the holes are moving to the right, the resistivity increases super linearly to the right. If holes move to the left, then it increases to the left. And so a very um, remarkable point here is that for uh, drift velocities of around uh, 140 kilometers per second, there is an increase of 12 times the resistivity in over uh, eight microns of the device. Okay, so uh, what happens with the carrier density dependence? Okay, so in this case, we are uh, measuring a, this pair of contacts at uh, different uh, carrier densities. And so we see that if we plot the differential resistivity for all of these carrier densities versus the um, current, uh, there is this asymmetric uh, behavior and uh, the higher uh, increase of the differential resistivity happens when the electrons uh, move in this uh, direction. But we don't see actually like a um, starting point when we plot uh, versus the current. But if instead uh, we plot this data versus the drift velocity using this uh, very simple equation, um, we can see that there is a partial collapse of all of the curves and that uh, the turn on point for these non-linearities occurs always 
at uh, drift velocities uh, larger than the speed of sound. And so is this uh, sharing of an amplification? Well, uh, the resistivity grows super linearly in the direction of the carrier flow. And that is exactly what we should expect uh, from the results that uh, this group got. We, they saw like th there was this uh, exponential, exponential increment of the phonon population. So we should see a nonlinear increment in the direction of the carrier flow. And we also see that the nonlinearities are activated when the drift velocity exceeds, exceeds the sound velocity in the graphene. And this uh, matches with the model that we have for sharing of uh, phonon amplification. So the observations so far agree with the phonon amplification model. And another experiment that uh, we can make to corroborate that we have uh, sharing of phonon amplification is to measure the temperature dependence of uh, this phenomenon. So what should we expect? Okay, so uh, if the electrons are moving in the direction where we are not expecting to have a very large uh, phonon amplification, we can see that uh, the resistivity increases uh, with temperature. And this is what we regularly expect for a semi-metal or, or a metal uh, to happen. The resistivity increases with the temperature. But what happens when we measure in the direction where we are expecting to have an actual phonon amplification. Well, uh, it turns out that in this case, uh, the resistivity decreases with temperature. And this is something that we should expect because when we are uh, heating our sample, we are reducing the lifetime of the phonons and therefore the phonon amplification is gonna be uh, smaller and it's smaller and that's what we see here. But um, a very interesting feature of this uh, plot is that for 280 Kelvin, we are still able to see the effects of uh, this phonon amplification. And so um, what happens uh, with the longitudinal resistivity of the device when we plot it uh, versus the temperature? So in the direction, where we are not expecting to see uh, much phonon amplification, we see the regular uh, metallic or semi-metallic uh, behavior that we should expect uh, of the resistivity increasing with temperature. And we can see that actually uh, increasing the drift velocity in this direction uh, has a very uh, small effect on the resistivity. On the other hand, if we measure in the direction where we are expecting to have a very large uh, or a large phonon amplification, we can see how uh, the resistivity, the resistance, sorry, increases uh, at low temperatures. And um, so this basically is telling us that, or this agrees with the phonon amplification model. So the takeaways from this slide is that uh, phonon amplification is reduced at high temperatures because of shorter phonon lifetime and that we are still able to see the effects of phonon amplification at uh, 280 Kelvin. And this is a very important result because 280 Kelvin is like having the sample inside a regular fridge. So this is a very interesting result. So um, conclusions and uh, fewer work for this uh, project. So we saw that phonon amplification has a very strong effect on graphene resistance at moderate current densities. And so uh, the effects of phonon amplification are strongest from one to a hundred Kelvin, but they are still evident at near room temperatures. And uh, this phenomena can be the basis for the fabrication of on-chip sources of high frequency acoustic waves, specifically in the range of the terahertz. And so what's next for uh, this project? Okay, well, we would like to prove the frequency of these phonons and we expect to see phonons in the terahertz uh, regime. 
And we also want to use uh, these formings to excite twisted header structures of Van der Waals materials. And another interesting uh, project will be to convert this acoustic uh, terahertz phonons to terahertz electromagnetic uh, radiation. Uh, okay, since uh, we still have uh, some time left and I'm feeling uh, generous today, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, another project that we have going on in uh, the lab. And this is called uh, Mechanically Reconfigurable Van der Waals Devices Enabled by uh, Gold Sliding. So um, once uh, an electronic device is fabricated, uh, usually we cannot longer modify its uh, physical structure due to atomic bonds between the components or the layers of uh, these devices or due to the high friction between them. However, in Van der Waals materials, we don't have those out of plane atomic bonds and the surface of the crystals is atomically flat. So the friction can be uh, very low. And so a few uh, research groups have uh, taken advantage of these properties and fabricated reconfigurable Van der Waals header structures. Uh, in the specific case that we are seeing here uh, in this uh, image, uh, they basically uh, fabricated an encapsulated uh, graphing device where the top VN can be rotated to study the properties of the device at different uh, twist angles. So with this work, uh, they basically have demonstrated that there exists very low friction between single crystal uh, Van der Waals materials uh, that allows this type of reconfigurations. And inspired by the work of these uh, research groups, we decided to take a different approach to the subject. And uh, we decided to test how uh, lithographically designed polycrystalline gold structures slide on top of a Van der Waals uh, materials. So, these uh, gold features that we see here uh, were designed and deposited on top of HVN, of an HVN flake, and by pushing them laterally with an AFM tip uh, in our part NX10, uh, we were able to slide these gold features around on top of the VN without damaging the, the surface of the, of the VN, which is very interesting. And we found that actually the friction of these gold features uh, scales linearly with the area of the feature. So um, we decided to take advantage of this capability and fabricate a reconfigurable uh, quantum point contacts in a graphene device. So to create this uh, quantum point contact, uh, we made an encapsulated graphene graphing device with a local back uh, graphite gate. And uh, on top of it, uh, we deposited this uh, triangular gold top gate whose separation can be uh, varied uh, to like uh, manipulate, let's say the, the properties of the device. And so this is a picture of how the, device actually looks. And so we operated uh, this device in the quantum hole regime. And um, we kept the backgated region, this region here, uh, a filling factor of minus two, whereas the area or the region under the gold top base was kept at a filling factor of zero, uh, forcing the edge modes uh, to flow through the constriction between uh, these two uh, top gates. And so when the constriction is big, as is uh, the case of uh, the blue curve that we are uh, showing here, uh, we see that the edge modes uh, do not interact with, the, with each other. And we actually measure the regular plateaus of conductance that uh, we should expect for that specific uh, feeling factor. But when we start uh, pushing the gates 
together and the constriction starts getting smaller, we can see that the edge modes start to uh, interact with each other until the outermost mode is uh, completely backscattered. And um, with this experiment, we are basically demonstrating that goal features can be moved deterministically on top of uh, Van der Waals materials to manipulate the electronic properties of the devices. And uh, so what is next for this uh, project? Well, in the future, uh, we would like to slide uh, these goal features in situ, this means while we are measuring it, to um, test the dyna dynamical properties of the devices. And we also uh, would like to measure, uh, to slide full uh, devices and measure their dynamical properties. And so uh, thank you so much for attending the talk and thank you so much to the team that made this possible, Professor Sanchez Yamagishi, uh, Jason Sion, who was uh, helping me with the uh, fund amplification project, Ian Sequeira and Andrew Varamas, who are the graduate students pushing the sliding pro project, and Yu Hui Yang, who is a non graduate researcher helping in the sliding project. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Barajas, for your presentation. Um, we will now be moving on to the live Q&A if anyone had any questions. Uh, once again, you can either ask them in the chat or in the Q&A box, and we will make sure to get those answered. Um, I already see one in the Q&A. So the first question is, how tall were those gold features? And is there an AFM cantilever that pushes on the gold feature. Yeah, the gold features are around uh, 100 nanometers tall, and we also uh, deposit uh, cross-linked uh, resist on top of them so that we can push them around. And we use a regular uh, TAP 300 uh, tip to measure the, to, to move the uh, features around. Okay, it looks like, there are no more questions at this time. Once again, thank you, Dr. Barajas, for taking time to present. And also, I think I see Dr. Javier Sanchez Yamagishi actually in the, the audience as well. So, so thank you for, for your support. Um, thank you.